personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Resistance Library Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Jacobs. Uh, Today we have kind of a different episode, the one that I think will be really uh, interesting and kind of give people some food for thought and hopefully add some books to their reading list. I'm joined by uh, Josh Delani. He is a writer from India who focuses on political and philosophical questions around excellence and freedom, which I think are, are very interesting topics. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Sam. Great to be doing this chat with you. So you are on Twitter, the old books guy. And how did you how did you become the old books guy? How did that kind of become your thing? Yeah, well, you know, I started using Twitter actively uh, in 2020, uh, after the COVID lockdown, you know, when I was looking for new things to consume and look at and just had a lot of free time on my hands. I got on Twitter because I was already using Instagram. I was, you know, I wasn't using Facebook because uh, I feel like that's a dead platform in terms of, at least in terms of like ideas, like no interesting debate happens there anymore. So I just kind of got on Twitter. I kind of only used Twitter initially to see Donald Trump's tweets, if you can imagine that, uh, because they were just so interesting. So I only used to get on Twitter, look at his new tweets and go out. But eventually I started using it more regularly. And I saw that people were uh, picking up a niche and sticking to it. So I saw this guy, David Perel, who is the writing guy. And then I saw some other people who were like the marketing guy. So people were like picking a niche and defining themselves around it. And that's how they were building their audience. And the old books guy was a space that was uh, just there for the taking. So yeah, that's how it kind of started. Uh, that's how it uh, started actually. So To kind of get the question that I think is important and not enough people think about out of the way, why does philosophy matter? Like, why should, you know, I don't know the average person, but like, you know, the person who um, is interested in self-improvement, is interested in uh, obtaining a, a bigger picture of the world, you know, what, how does philosophy help? you to grow as a human being in the study and reading of it? Yeah, I think that's a great question, right? And it's an important one uh, because, uh, you know, something that I've discussed before with my friends is that uh, a lot of, like, uh, there's some anxiety around, should we be spending so much time thinking? You know, should we, are we wasting our time just uh, juggling these questions and issues in our heads? You know, are we actually cowards who do not have an action bias and we are fooling ourselves by playing around with these philosophical questions, right? Uh, It is something that I have wondered and it's something that my friends have sort of accused themselves of and each other of. So, you know, this is an anxiety which is uh, common, if not common, then maybe not exactly uncommon common among uh, relatively intelligent people and I think the answer finally at least for me comes down to that if you're not going to engage philosophically with uh, questions of what should you do with your time what sort of a government should a country have uh, how should you behave yourself in life right all of these questions if you're not going to engage with them at a deeper philosophical level you're going to fall into the default of your age Right. Right. Whatever is the status quo, you're going to follow it because it's going to be easy and it's going to be a path of least resistance. And if you want to do that, then you can. But I think people with integrity or people who believe that they owe it to themselves to actually look at things and then decide what to do, then philosophy is your only option. And this is philosophy as broadly considered. You know, it's not just oh, you know, let's discuss ethics on a on an oak table round conference. You know, it's just uh, let's discuss philosophy in terms of what should we do. Like, let's make sure that our action and decisions and choices uh, are influenced by deeper consideration. 
So it's design versus default. Like if you don't want to fall into the default uh, lifestyle, the default mindset, the default thought process, the default voting patterns of your age, you have to become, if you want to design all of that, if you want to design your lifestyle, if you want to design your mindset, then you have to become philosophical. I think that that's a really good point. And I think that most people listening to this are very much on board with the idea of not just kind of going along uh, with the age. I mean, I think I think that's a very, very important uh, point that you raise. So as to kind of piggyback off of that, why are old books yeah. important as opposed to new ones? Like what do old books teach us that new books do not? Yeah, you know, like a very short answer to that is the new books are telling me what my peers have told me and they're telling me what my professors have told me and they are telling me what's in the headlines. Like I know what the new books are telling me, you know, and the old books are a reference point. They were written at a different point in time. They were written when people's ethical priorities were not what they are right now. They were written when people... I think, you know, we may not look very different than human beings who lived 700 years ago, but internally, psychologically, we are very different. And our instincts are different. And what we value has changed so much. Uh, Of course, the change of the, you know, the position that religion occupies in society has been a big change um, from the past to right now. But I think other aspects have also changed. And so old books are just a window into a different period. And they might show us something um, better than what we have right now. So, you know, Leo Strauss makes this point very well when he says that you have to understand the origin of the current system, the current ethical uh, priorities that people have. And, you know, Michael Millerman, uh, the Straussian lecturer and thinker on Twitter, shout out to Michael Millerman. Uh, I learned this in one of his podcasts. And Uh, What Strauss basically says is you have to be curious about the origin of the current order. And to do that, you have to sort of go back to at what point in history the current order originated and what were the alternatives which did not, which were not adopted. And why were they not adopted? Were they necessarily uh, worse or was it a matter of contingency? Was it a matter of uh, political maneuvering? that a better order did not come about and instead we got what we got. So old books, old philosophers are just a window into all of these questions. I think that's a, I think that's very, very well put. And I obviously love any uh, re- reference to Leo Strauss. So thank you for that. Um, so the reason that I asked you to come on was because you did a very interesting and intelligent thread about the overlap and parallel of uh, Frederick Nietzsche with Bronze Age Pervert. For those of you who don't know, uh, Bronze Age Pervert is a pseudonymous writer um, who, until very recently, was on Twitter. He wrote a book called Bronze Age Mindset that I, I strongly recommend uh, anybody read. But um, it is, people do find it to be a bit of a tough read to give you a, a, a warning. But the whole reason I wanted to have you on was because I thought that you very you engage that material very intelligently uh, and very seriously, which I think it's, you know, there's some silliness to it for people playing at home who have no idea what we're talking about. But, um, you know, the, the issues that it deals with are very, very serious ones. And it's dealt with in a, in a, uh, in, in intelligent way that kind of gives some exposition and some deeper understanding of the world in which we live. But, Nietzsche and Bronze Age Pervert and many other writers who I enjoy quite a bit are kind of lumped into this I, school is not really the right way to put it, but a sort of philosophical mood uh, called philosophical pessimism. So could you kind of explain to the listeners what philosophical pessimism is, who these people are and what they're pessimistic about? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was the thread that I put out sometime uh, last month. No, this month, actually in October, because of Nietzsche's birthday on 15th October. And uh, yeah, Bob is one of the most interesting uh, Nietzscheans and probably one of the most influential ones, because he has this lingo and he has this uh, way of talking, which is very contemporary, but also very Nietzschean at the same time. And uh, yeah, this philosophical mood, philosophical pessimism, and what are 
are the uh, what are the core sort of observations of people in this space and i think the one of the core observations of people like bronze age pervert and nietzsche and you know i went through your substack and you have also brought up ayn rand in one of your newsletters and even ayn rand could fit into uh, you know this group and one of the things that all three of them would uh, say and do say is that we are living in an age where uh, we are we are not valuing the right things like there is an inversion in terms of what we are valorizing and what we are uh, what we have contempt for that what we should worship we are casting aspersions and stones on and what we should denounce we are worshiping so to be more specific you know we should worship people who are risk takers who are entrepreneurs who or dare to sacrifice themselves for the progress of their own self their own company but by extension the human race but what we see more often is that we look at people like Elon Musk not with uh not with uh, you know uh what not with a perspective of this guy is genuinely pushing some real boundaries but with a perspective of how can we tax him so that he's no longer a billionaire right. you know and there are uh, congress congress women and there are sort of uh, people uh, in the you know american parliament who are uh, publicly going to twitter and putting out fuck elon musk you know on their twitter and so i think what nietzsche would sort of say to that is that here's a guy who should be held up as not as the ubermensch not as the superman necessarily but who is at least trying to uh, you know cross um, cross uh, bridges which are uh, over uh, testy stormy waters and the reason i use that language is because of nietzsche's famous line man is not a destination he is a bridge to be crossed and left behind right i'm paraphrasing him but that's roughly the idea and so this inversion of who we value and what we value is something which is an important part of philosophical uh, pessimism um something to draw from one of your pieces is when you say that uh, not all of us are going to make it like the pessimism is that when you talk about when the age talks about human equality right not all of us are going to excel not all of us are going to succeed uh like everyone else so the pessimism is regarding this idea of um like having like we are not all created from the same material and we don't share the same destiny and there is going to be a wild inequality and variety in terms of where people end up and a politics which is premised on the exact opposite of that which believes that oh we can actually share the same destiny and we should actually share the same destiny a politics based around those ideas is based around a deeply unnatural premise and is bound to fail and before it fails it's bound to create a lot of suffering because it's based on a lie so i'm not sure if that exactly answers what you asked no i think that that's i think that that's very very well put um so what are you know in 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 modern life you know what are kind of some of the fundamental problems for the philosophical pessimists and also I'm sort of you know you mentioned that you are interested in these questions around excellence and freedom so I'd like you to speak a little more kind of even before you talk about the you know the problems they identify in modern life but like what you just talked about you know how does this what does it say about the very concept of of human freedom you know what are, what how free are people to uh in this kind of you know view of the world yeah so yeah when you uh you know talk about excellence and freedom uh i think there is a natural tension between the two um because freedom is what freedom is the ability to do whatever you want whenever you want but if you do sort of go down that track then it's uh, difficult to imagine you becoming really excellent at something uh you know nietzsche uh says something along these lines that you have to enslave yourself to something or someone for a protracted period of time otherwise you will never have any self respect for yourself and that's a difficult idea to uh, wrap your brain around especially coming from a guy who famously proclaimed the death of god 
And but I think that this is the thing with Nietzsche is that he always realized that what he was attacking was in and itself not without value. So this is something that he says in his last book, The Will to Power, that whenever he chose an opponent, whenever he chose to attack a person, a philosopher, a school of thought, a religion, he was doing it from a place of great respect. Like by choosing an enemy, he was almost worshipping it. Yeah. And he says that at a different point that you, you may not despise your enemy. Because if you despise your enemy, that means you have taken on someone or something you consider pathetic and worthless, and you should never fight with those things. You should let them be. You should only engage in, you should only wage war on things which are almost your equal or even more than your equal. So when Nietzsche is talking about the death of God, he's not saying become atheists with no moral compass, right? right. He is saying something else, uh, which we can get to. But uh, what I originally started talking about was this idea that you must enslave yourself, right? Uh, sounds like uh, not, not, a, not a guy who loves freedom too much. But of course, his point is that excellence can only be achieved through protracted, uh, you know, when you put yourself under conditioning, under rules, under people who know better. Like imagine, like think of these UFC fighters who, uh, who, who like everything from the moment they wake up in the morning to what they eat for dinner at night is measured and it's uh, predetermined and they cannot, they're not free to go down, uh, you know, sort of to drive down and, you know, get a burger. Um, they are under extreme conditions and they almost right. have no free moves left in life. And so excellence comes at the cost of freedom in some way. But before you become excellent, like, what are you? Like, you're just an amorphous sort of thing floating around. And yes, you're free. You're free like a directionless eddy in a river is free. You know, it could go right, it right. could go left, it could, you know flow in whatever direction it wants but it never really that that eddy doesn't does not have a story it does not have a progression and as human beings we desire stories we desire our life to have a progression and that comes at the cost of some slavery and letting go of some freedom um so i you know to kind of bring this back what are in mo in modern life what are the kind of uh fundamental problems that people are confronted with that are specific to modern life that are not kind of sort of, you know, these eternal problems of the ages, because I do think that, you know, and not to get too deep into the weeds about it, because I don't, you know, I want people who yeah. don't know anything about this to be able to follow it. Um, but, yeah. you know, for, I think for, for Schopenhauer, everything is, these problems are just eternal problems of life. And there's, you know, there may be kind of complications of modern life added to them, but fundamentally it's about the problem of being a human being in a uh, decaying creation. But I think that other writers um, such as Hulbeck, for example, talk about things that are specifically germane to the world as it exists in 2021. So how, how, how would you kind of, you know, explain the relevance of this to contemporary life and the problems that are being identified in contemporary life that are, you know, specific and new. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great question because uh, we basically have two camps here, right? Like one camp, uh, probably led by Schopenhauer, uh, would say that uh, the problems that you have are nothing unique. It's only the skin at the top which changes. It's only the color of your clothes, which are different. Underneath, you have the same human body, the same human problems that everyone has always had. And he was, of course, a reductionist par excellence. And so he reduced everything to the will. And for him, the will always uh, strove and strove, and it never really reached proper uh, satiety, and it never really sort of reached proper fulfillment. And that's why, you know, he uh, talked about it almost denying the will its adventures. Like, do not let your desires run amok. Do not uh, become a slave to the... Uh, to the moods of your will, but, you know, sort of subdue them. And so he was a quasi Buddhist in that sense, too. And then the other camp would be that, no, there are actually differences in how different ages 
or have different challenges to overcome. And I think I would be sort of more at home in the second camp because I definitely think uh, problems, we have eternal problems, but we have problems which uh, we have that people 100 years ago did not have. So, you know, a few examples. Um, Of course, uh, you think about it this way, uh, how people have become a lot more socially awkward, how we have the internet and the internet makes communication easy in a lot of ways. So the two of us are sitting in different time zones. We are sitting in different parts of the world, but we can have a coherent linear conversation. You know, we are not exchanging letters. We are not sort of waiting for each other's replies for weeks on end. We're just having a simultaneous conversation almost as if we were face to face. And if we did this in person, if we did this over a video, we would literally be in face to face while being thousands of miles away. So the internet has made communication easy, but it's also made it harder. Because uh, now that I can tweet out to the world sitting from my room in uh, Ahmedabad in India, you know, what is my incentive for going out there and actually chatting with people and actually meeting people in real life? And people are substituting real life for whatever is the internet alternative. So friendship, the chatter that happens among friends is now happening through court tweets and is now happening through comments on uh, YouTube. And uh, the romance that happens between two strangers in real life is now happening through chats on Tinder, Tinder and Bumble. And so I think these are new problems that now we are being seduced by all of these, I believe, substandard alternatives to right. what are natural urges of friendship and seeking out dating partners. These natural impulses are being subverted in a way that Schopenhauer didn't have to deal with, you know? And so we do have modern problems, which um, are, you know, you could always reduce it. You could always say that there is like each man and each woman in all ages have had cowardly ways out, you know? So oh, you, you don't want to approach a woman in real life. Well, there is Pornhub for you, right? So that's a cowardly way out. And you could say, All human beings across history have always had the cowardly way out. And most people kind of take that, even though it may weigh heavy on their conscience uh, then and there or perhaps later. Um, So if you reduce the problem to that, then you could say that, oh, this is an eternal problem. But I think then it comes back to at what level do you specify the problem? You know, Mm -hmm. I I hope that made sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that you know, personally, I'm I am more interested philosophically in um, specificity and division yeah. and finding difference in things. And uh, you know, I mean, I think that there's like, I think that the opposite manner of thinking about things, and you know, everything is the same and nothing ever changes. Um, I think it certainly can be a very intellectually lazy way to view the world. Um, I don't, you know, obviously I don't think it universally is, but I, I generally, you know, most people who I find doing the kinds of, well, you know, it's always been that way sorts of takes. And I don't mean, you know, the guy at the grocery store. I mean, you know, people who kind of fancy sure. themselves as some kind of thinker. Um, I generally find it to be a very, very lazy approach uh, because to me, the, the, you know, my emphasis is on finding difference, distinction. Um, things like that, which I, I think is an important kind of um, difference in the approach that people have to any philosophical question. So what's the, you know, what's the way out? What do we, not even, I don't even want to frame it in terms of way out. Let's talk about, you know, what is, I don't, and I don't want to say solution either. What is the proper response to that the situation that you describe both in the modern world and, you know, in, for these kinds of eternal questions, you know, how are, because I think that, you know, I am definitely more the type of guy who can identify a problem and maybe not come up with a solution for it, particularly when we're talking about, you know, big uh, kinds of questions. But I do think that, Somebody, you know, when you're talking, when you're evaluating any kind of philosophical trend or uh, school of thought, you ultimately have to ask yourself, okay, well, so what? What are they proposing that we actually do about any of this? Um, I think that they're, you know, the answer, well, you can't really do anything about it is, 
I, I'm fine with that answer uh, because I think that oftentimes that yeah. is, that is the answer, uh, and that we just have to kind of you know live with things, and that our our ability to do that is the measure of our kind of you know ability to cope with these problems. But I, I'm guessing, knowing what I know about the you know trend or mood of philosophical pessimism, that there's you know probably about 10 different answers to this, but what is the appropriate response for the pessimists to the observations that they're making? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, you know, I could, I could take the easy way out and just open uh, my copy of Bronze Age Mindset and read you a paragraph, you know, and call it a day. <laughs> But uh, let me let me try to do this in my words. And I, you know, I also before getting to this, I found what you said about uh, this urge to universalize and the urge to differentiate. Yeah. Interesting. And I think there are those two different urges, and uh, in different thinkers, different urges are dominant. Like some thinkers are always interested in clubbing things together, and others are always into about you know how can I break this apart and how can I uh, sort of uh, you know do a surgery on it and sort of tear it apart in different directions. Yeah. And uh, I think Nietzsche is uh, Nietzsche would be in the second camp, right? There is this one interesting passage where he deconstructs the idea of the peace of soul. You know how uh, there are some Christian verses along these lines, a peace, a peace that passeth all understanding. Uh, there's this idea that there is a peace of soul to be attained through certain activities, through certain beliefs, through certain rituals, right? Through living a certain way. And in this paragraph, in this passage that I'm talking about, Nietzsche deconstructs that whole idea into different directions. And he says, is peace of soul nothing more than laziness, Right. Or is it just uh, the contentment of a good meal, right? Mm -hmm. And then he says, or is peace of soul just a good conscience? Or is it a forgetful conscience, right? Mm -hmm. And so he takes this idea of a peace of soul and he gives it like 10 different spins. And uh, I think that is what is required more than the urge to universalize, because uh, what we had in the 20th, 20th century, not to generalize a whole century and to do the exact opposite of what I'm talking right. about, uh, but <laughs> there was this sort of uh, desire to put men and women across the world into the same category of human and to talk about human rights and to talk about how everyone everywhere Assam basically wants the same thing. Uh, you know, Tolstoy, all, uh, all happy families are alike and how all unhappy families are uh, unhappy in different ways. Yeah. No family is alike. No human is alike. You know, let's go with that. And then we can sort of uh, ex escape sort of the because once you accept that all human beings are basically alike what we're basically being told is that okay now you may not waver and you may not go in a different direction make a different choice have a different belief you know like if we all have the same rights then uh, maybe there's a short a uh, quick path from equal rights to equal obligations and to equal mindsets you know, like, does equality really stop at rights? Like, what would be the logic for that? I think it spreads. And so definitely let's go in the direction of finding differences and distinct, you know, distinguishing between one and the other. And uh, that might that might even be a sign of intellectual stamina, according to Nietzsche. Because he often talks about how when monotheistic religions develop, he sees that as a sign of weakness, because people are no longer able to hold in their minds the personalities of different gods. And so they, they just want to remember one and they just want to worship one. But when people lived in polytheistic societies, as a lot of people still do, there are all these different gods and they have different moods and they have the hierarchy is not stable you know, like sometimes some God is on top mm -hmm. you know, in a different season, another God is on top. And so it's a moving religious picture. While if you look at uh, monotheistic religions, the picture is very uh, stable and almost stagnant. And, you know, it not, not, doesn't have too much variety, not to, uh, you know, not to sort of put, I'm not putting polytheistic religions over monotheistic ones, but Nietzsche often did. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to that. So, yeah, if you if you have comments on this bit or uh, we can get to, you know, the solutions for. 
Yeah. So what, yeah. So talk about like what is you know how do how are we to live? I guess is a good way of asking it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, everyone will have a different answer. And so if we were to present, uh, if I were to present a universal answer, or if, uh, you know, Bronze Spur would, was to present a universal answer, uh, we would be putting ourselves like in the camp of Karl Marx, you know, and we mm-hmm. don't want to do that. So we don't want to give a universal answer. But there's something to uh, looking at references. And I think that is what is like, bro- what Bronze Age mindset by Bronze Age Perwood, like what it mostly does is it gives you a reference of a different kind of life, right? So Bob is talking, Bronze Age Perwood, Bob, uh, BAP, he's talking about all of these different figures in history and he is actually very vivid in the way he's describing their actual actions and their actual life. And he's presenting an alternative to the life that we have today. And that is always a good step number one. You know, you ultimately want to figure out how you should live and people want to figure that out on their own and in their own life. A step number one, which might be common is find references. And if you are reading a book and then you read a second book and you read the 20th book of that year and they're all new books and you feel like, you know, I don't feel like these protagonists are all that different. You know how we had this book, Gone Girl, and then we had another book, The Girl on the Train, you know, and then Mm -hmm. we had other books with the girl in the title because people were just creating similar protagonists because that was what was working. And so these are not useful references because they're all alike and they're probably a little bit like your neighbor and they're probably a little bit like yourself. So you want to venture beyond the mainstream and you want to look at references from old books, old movies, old historical figures, old people in your own life and how their instincts are very different from yours. And when you look at all these references, something will start to resonate with you. You know, like you follow like 2000 extremely different people on Twitter and you kind of look at what they're posting and eventually a few of them will start to resonate with you. And these are the people, these are the ideas which are calling forth something buried inside you that nothing before has called forth. And that's kind of how you go down one particular path and not the other. You know, I could uh, I could sort of tell you an interesting story of how my personal priorities have kind of changed after being on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it could be like a specific example of what I'm talking about. Yeah, go for it. I so, love to hear uh, yeah, so last year before I got on Twitter, you know, my 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 ambition in life was to be a screenwriter. So I've always been the guy who enjoyed writing stories, who enjoyed making short films. I made a bunch of short films in college, you know, participated in some film festivals and yada, yada, yada. You know, so I was this guy who enjoyed telling stories in written and in film form. And I wanted to be a filmmaker, wanted to be a screenwriter. And I wrote some episodes of an upcoming uh, show on Netflix in India. And so, you know, I had some success. And by the time we go into COVID-19 lockdowns so here and everywhere else also, I was on this track. Like I wanted to be a filmmaker. But then I get on Twitter and I start looking at all of these different accounts and I start sort of reading their tweets. I start reading their Twitter threads. One account in particular was uh, Wrath of Genon. You oh, yeah. know, you know, the guy I'm talking about. Yep. Yeah. So this is this is also an anonymous guy, probably lives in Japan, super interested in architecture, posts a lot about how the urban life that we have is basically a blight and how the urban landscape that we have is terrible and how architecture and urban design are not are not actually progressing. They are regressing. Right. And how towns built 500 years ago are in better shape than certain parts of certain cities built five years ago, you know. And so I started mm-hmm. thinking about that. And I, and more particularly, I started thinking about the difference between creating something intangible like a script or a film and creating something tangible like a building or a town which will last for 500 years. Right. And that sort of, you know, it triggered something in me and it sort of gave me a reference point of a completely different life, right? A life built on like a a life committed to building tangible real things and not intangible things like a movie or a book not you know of course uh, if you if you look at my room it's nothing but books and so I'm a very bookish guy I love books right so this is not uh, a snarky way of putting down people who generate knowledge right but it's uh, 
that is that is something that I wanted to do myself. But now looking at the references of people who are building tangible, uh, you know, parts in certain cities and they are building buildings and they are sort of using architecture to generate beauty, which will be around even after centuries have gone by. Uh, that gave me a reference point that nothing else had given me. And it made it changed my priorities in my own life. And it sort of called forth something which was always in there this desire to build real things or uh, things that can be touched um, versus things that you think about or mm-hmm. things that you hear or read, uh, it called for the desire. And I, I don't think it would have sort of sort of surfaced if I did not follow Wrath of Xenon, you know? So that's like an interesting specific example of what I described before. Yeah, that's uh that is really interesting. And uh, I think that, you know, the, the difference between, you know, even the difference between the physical object of a book and the the ideas contained inside, you know, I think that that's a it's an interesting um, distinction to to mull over to kind of get at some some important ideas. Um, I did want to move on to asking you about, and this is a good segue for this, kind of how the ideas of pessimism that we're talking about, how do they express themselves? in the world of art. You know, I mentioned Michelle Huelbeck, uh, HP Lovecraft yeah. isn't, would be another one who, you know, uh, Huelbeck wrote a brilliant essay about, about 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, you know, what kind of things is the, does the art do and say to us and how does it express these ideas? Yeah. Um, because art provides a better reference point than only ideas, right? Like if you actually see a character live in a certain way in a play or in a movie or in a novel, then then if he embodies the ideas, then that's a better way of engaging with the ideas than reading about them in Schopenhauer, right? Or Nietzsche. And uh, um, yeah, that's an interesting question, I think. Um, so if philosophical pessimism is this idea that, uh, you know, we are sort of uh, like Schopenhauer would talk about it in these words that um, perhaps the way out is to resign ourselves to the futility of the striving and to sort of deny the energy of the will. I'm not sure if you would agree with that description, mm-hmm. but that is sort of roughly what I have gathered from Schopenhauer. Um, and Nietzsche would say that, no, you actually sort of uh, accept that the will is basically striving in random directions, but then you try to take charge of the chaos and you create your own goals. And there is no goal which is uh, sanctified by God. You know, there is mm-hmm. no goal which is objectively the right thing to aim at, but you are actually capable enough and may just have the dignity enough to create a goal which is worthy of being chased, even though God did not, uh, even though God did not approve it, you know, mm-hmm. even though only you approved it. So, yeah. Um, uh, you, uh, your original question was, can art be a useful, uh, you know, way to engage with these questions? And I think yes, it can be. Um, I I'm not sure if you know about this book called The Dice Man. Uh, have you heard of it? I have heard of it, but cannot recall anything other than that I've heard of the title right now. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'll just quickly tell you about it. It's about this one psychiatrist who does who no longer believes in the practice of psychiatry and in the um, in the standard beliefs of like psychological theory. You know, he doesn't believe that he's helping his patients recover or get better in any way. So then he flips out. He he decides to make every single life decision by casting a dice. Uh-huh. So, you know, should I, for example, this is from the book, should I cheat on my wife? Right. And then he will write down six different possibilities. Yes, no, yes, but, no, but. Right. So he will write down six different possibilities. He will cast a dice and whatever he gets, he will do it. Right. So Mm -hmm. the whole book is him casting a dice and just doing things. And so he, you know, it's it's interesting to look at him through the lens of philosophical pessimism. Like this guy is pessimistic in a very philosophical way about the ultimate goal of things and about whether what he's doing in life is leading up to anything. And his response to that was to embrace not a particular self-created goal like Nietzsche would. Mm -hmm. Right. And his response was not to completely subdue his desires and his will, his striving, like Schopenhauer would, mm-hmm. but to sort of embrace randomness. 
like to just go like you know my own will i'm not going to place it on a pedestal i'm actually going to give myself over to chance and that is a very shocking thing to do and it's a very intriguing book for that reason and uh, it uh, i have not uh, read a lot of uh, uh, hp lovecraft you know perhaps you can tell me how he talks about things uh, with reference to philosophical pessimism but the dice man kind of did that for me because it made me think about you know it made me i to some degree or the other you know i suppose i am also pessimistic about what should we do with our time what should we do with our energies right what should we do with whatever talent we may have how should we employ these things so that here was a guy in the dice man with a lot of time and talent and ability and he kind of chose to give it all on the altar of randomness like on the altar of casting on dice So that was an interesting book for me uh, but I'd love to hear what novel or story or thinker has sort of uh, brought these questions alive for you. Well, I would say uh, primarily well back. I mean, I read a lot of Nietzsche okay. when I was younger and still reread Nietzsche. Um but primarily Yeah, you know, tell me more. Well, um you know, I mean, I I took a class in college that was that was about Nietzsche and we read a lot of Nietzsche. I mean, we plowed through, you know, most of the bigger works. Um I think at this point the only things that I haven't read by him that would be considered like major works are uh, oddly Birth of Tragedy and Zarathustra. Um but okay. you know, Beyond Good and Evil, Genealogy of Morals, Antichrist, um there's others that are slipping my mind and yeah you know but the thing that really clicked and brought it alive for me was well back because of it because of its okay. uh how tied to modernity it is now that said um you know i think wellback is probably the greatest living writer but i don't think that he is fit to polish the boots of yukio mishima you know not that it's a okay. a competition by any stretch of the imagination but like yukio mishima's yeah. craft is just on a completely other level than anyone i've ever read and um yeah. you know i grew up in providence so i was always reading lots of lovecraft um lovecraft for me is about the unimportance of man's place in the universe ultimately um that man is not yeah. only not the center of the universe but not that important with regard to even mm-hmm. our own history on earth um and you know for nietzsche or for lovecraft rather um they're kind of i would say the if we're talking about you know how do you respond uh as a solution for lack of a better term um you know yeah. i this may be a bit of a lazy answer but i feel like for lovecraft the answer is madness you know i don't know that he provides any mm-hmm. other um response to yeah. that level of kind of cosmic pessimism um and i'm not sure that there is really any other appropriate response i think that with hellback you know i think that people focus on submission a lot and kind of see that work as an endorsement of a uh, total sublimation of the will in the same way that schopenhauer did um i think yeah that that, that i think that's present only, uh, book I've read. Yeah, yeah, yeah i think yeah. that that's present that's only book by wellback that i've read yeah 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 i think that 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 impulse is present in wellback but he also mm-hmm. discusses things like transhumanism um i don't think that you can completely write off the role that unchecked hedonism plays in the work of hellback as a appropriate mm-hmm. response um but mm-hmm. you know i also think that in the possibility of an island you know his his whole vision of the of what humanity becomes when they're decoupled from transhumanism which i i would say in that book and for him kind of represents the the, the superman the ubermensch and he okay. he contrasts it with where humans go 
when they, you know, who's left in this world where transhuman uh, transhumanism has built an entirely new species and the people who choose to yeah. remain behind, you know, are, are portrayed in this kind of animalistic um, light, you know, they're, they're the last man, they're Nietzsche's last man, which is another thing I write about on, on, on Substack. I mean, the, the thing that is kind yeah. of attractive to me about pessimism is that it, presents fundamental questions of human existence that I don't think have easy answers. You know, I don't think that we, we, you know, we have a lot of overlap with conservatism and libertarianism on this show, but I think that to kind of tie it all together and put a bow on it, you know, the questions that I find interesting from pessimism, I find interesting because they offer strong and in my opinion often unanswerable challenges to the typical framework of conservatism and libertarianism and that doesn't mean you have to hold throw the whole thing out you know the the i think the yeah. kind of the mark of an intelligent thinker is go okay well my my existing framework has no answer for this so i need to change my existing framework that doesn't mean you burn the house down but you may want to renovate yeah. the kitchen. Um, and I think that for me, pessimism, um, I like the questions, you know, like that's why it's such a well that I continually go to because this pro this problem of excellence that you discuss, you know, most people are just not interested in any question of excellence and resent and are, um, uh, hostile to the very idea of human excellence today so what do you um you know what do you do about that um no one you know i i i don't i just don't see people kind of addressing these uh questions in an honest way you know people want to kind of hand wave this stuff and i don't think that there's any hand waving in. I don't think that there's any hand waving what I would consider the more fundamental and universal challenges of pessimism that yeah. you know the creation has fallen it doesn't matter if you're a religious person you can see this in you know if on a long longer historical timeline we can see this in the in the world of physics with entropy and you know the where is the universe ultimately headed it doesn't matter which school of physics you um you know, yeah. subscribe to, it's not improving is <laughs> the short version of where yeah. is the universe going according to physics? Well, it's not improving. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I think that there's these kinds of very basic fundamental truths. And then at the, at the, you know, kind of more immediate level, there's these problems of how we live with these fundamental truths. And then there are the specific yeah. truths of, um, you know, the things that you describe of the simulation and the reality and the simulation never having the um, satisfactory result that the that the the reality would give you. And, you know, this is ties it back into what I'm talking about earlier, where like the universe becomes in, uh, more degraded over time. And so you can link the universal and the specific by talking about how things have gotten worse over time and the specific way in which they've gotten worse over the last, let's say 50 years is that we've increasingly yeah. substituted these um, simulations for the real thing. Now the simulation does provide some kind of satisfaction, but it does not provide the same level of satisfaction as the real thing. And as we increasingly transition to these yeah. simulations, you and, know, things, uh, things get lost. Yeah, things get lost. And yeah, you, you know, perhaps it's useful to imagine or uh, to try to think, why do we have the ability to simulate things in the first place? Right? Like, why can I close my eyes and imagine a football match? 
like what is happening there and or, or imagine my near future or imagine my distant future like why do i have that ability to imagine things which are not there and this is something that i heard jordan peterson mention once in a lecture is that the reason we can do these things the reason we can simulate realities in our head and with the help of video games and books and you know music to do that the reason we can do that is because it it's better to sort of uh, get your leg chopped off in imagination than in reality, right? Like right. it's better to have a crocodile uh, or, you know, an alligator eat your hand off in your mind as opposed to in reality. And so simulation is an aid to escaping uh, danger in reality or to, uh, to, to, to sort of get something in reality that we can't without the simulation. You know, like if you actually sat down and sort of uh, simulated an environment in your head, you may be able to look at some benefits or some little hidden thing, which is good, but you may not be in the heat of the moment. And so simulation prepares you for life. And that's like the good thing about it. Mm -hmm. And that is why that is why we perhaps develop the ability to have simulations in the first place. Um, but if it if if all it does is sort of pull you away from life, then it's uh, negating its primary role, mm -hmm. and then you should sort of uh, reject it, right? So the question is like, why should we not live in the pod, right? Why mm -hmm. should we not live in the pod? Why should we not play realistic video games all day long? You know, why should we not enjoy sex robots, right? Mm -hmm. Why not? And, uh, you know, the answer is that, um, you know, Nietzsche says that no self-respecting man will, uh, like, he will even pick an easy enemy. You know, like, he always wants a difficult enemy. Like, he wants an enemy which will almost pull him down. And so to live a life with no, en to, with no enemies, with no challenges, with only your creaturely desires being permanently satisfied by some robotic configuration or the other, Right. Like, I think it will ultimately be like the final firewall against all of that is our own self-respect. You know, is this idea that we are better than this? I am better than this. And I think that's why I feel like dystopia will eventually stop at that and uh, then and then sort of recede. Because I don't think that thing will ever go away. Like people will always feel bad picking the easy way out, and uh, that sort of feel that 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 bad feeling won't let them rest until they do what they are supposed to do. Um, I want to close. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. I want to. I want to clo yeah. close by asking. Sure. I think what is kind of the obvious, <laughs> but often unasked question: um, How'd you get yeah. into all of this? You know, I get this is like the type of thing people ask me all the time, but I, I'm dying to know, like, yeah. kind of how this became your path. Yeah, well, well I, I think there are different answers and they're all true. You know, uh, like I could say that I, I feel like some people have an innate uh, have an innate sort of understanding of certain thinkers. Like when I read Nietzsche, right, like I never feel I like I never have to like read it twice. Like I mm -hmm. always understand what he's trying to say. And uh, that is no credit to like me per se or my ability to comprehend things. I think it's more about, I feel like my brain was just naturally Nietzschean before I ever heard of Frederick Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. And when I started reading him, there was a natural fit there. And so that is what kind of happened. Like I read, uh, you know, Will Durant's book, uh, The Story of Philosophy. Uh, my uncle gave it to me when I was around 15 and I kind of read it all. You know, I, I read Plato, I read Aristotle and uh, just all the thinkers, right? All the big ones. And Nietzsche was the one that spoke out to me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I then bought his books and started reading uh, him. Uh, of course, it, then there's the other answer that there was a girl in high school who was also <laughs> into Nietzsche and that may, or may, that may or may not have solidified my interest in him, you know? So, yeah, there are like a bunch of ways in which I kind of got into this stuff. Uh, but I always sort of had this, uh, you know, side which like wanted to know the answers. Like I wasn't happy with the default answers that I was getting through my education or uh, through the elders, you know. And so I always sort of read outside of that and uh, eventually stumbled on the people that we discussed today.
It's very cool. Um, what I, about you? I'm curious to, um, yeah. Well, I mean, there was the class, which was a big thing yeah. for me. Uh, it really was. I mean, it sounds so yeah, silly. Yeah. Like I took a class in college, but like I really, you know, um, I find Nietzsche to be intensely readable, especially in the Hollingdale yeah. translations. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was just, it, it appealed to me because I always, like the initial hook for me was just that I had always kind of, um, I always felt like the Socratic dialogues were a bit of a cope and that, yeah, you know, <laughs> there was like, the way that I talk about it now in a much more self-aware way, but this, this kind of attitude was forged, you know, during the, during the class that I took on Nietzsche, but you know, the interpretation yeah. everybody has of those like Socratic dialogues is, is that, you know, people are constantly taking off because they just can't handle these harsh truths that Socrates is dropping on right. them. And it's like, no, they're tired yeah. of talking to this idiot who's just never satisfied yeah. with any answer, <laughs> who's, you know, everything yeah. is, what do you mean by that? And what does this mean? And, you know, and they're just tired of talking to him because there's no, no mm -hmm. answer is ever going to satisfy Socrates. And yeah. there's this kind of nihilism yeah. that underpins the, you know, question everything ethos. That was another big reason why it was um, attractive to me because I went to a, it wasn't a very left-wing university, but I went to a, a, a large university with an active leftist activist population. And I was not, yeah. you know, terribly politically or philosophically aware in any way. I just knew I didn't like them. You know, I just, because they yeah, were irritating yeah. and they were crybabies and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a white guy and, you know, the whole kind of, bit and i just didn't like them and yeah. when yeah. you know i read nietzsche and kind of it, and the the class was on nietzsche and socrates so we did read the mm. early uh socratic dialogues of plato and yeah i was like one of maybe two people in the class who thought that socrates was this great villain and that was yeah. kind of my um, I introduction to it. And also, like, I just, you know, like you say, it was just, um, with Schopenhauer in particular, it was like, it, it just, yeah. it just clicked. Cause I was like, well, yeah, like the world sucks, you know, and like, <laughs> and right. wanting it to not suck yeah. is the course of. Especially yeah, you know, especially with all these leftists around us, right? You, know, you were like, uh, yeah, yeah. So that was, I mean, and with Schopenhauer, and then you know, Huelbeck, I just think is one hell of a writer, and but I think his observations about modernity um, are things that people should be, you know, reading and identifying with. Um, and you know, it was all kind of like, I mean, it was all kind of here and there. And it was only really at a certain yeah. point that I began to see like, oh, I get the, you know, I mean, people like um, the team, you, you mentioned yeah. Rand, um, you know, yeah. I, I would say Heinlein, um, though Heinlein, I think kind of has a tongue in cheek aspect about it, uh, which I think is fine yeah. because I think that, you know, that's kind of, we're talking about to, to kind of bring it all back. Like, what do you do about all of this? Um, I think that, yeah you know, one very appropriate response that you see in, in Heinlein and other places is, and, and yeah. probably the most common response to it from a you know, popular culture and popular artistic perspective. What do you do about it? Yeah. Um, you know, fuck it. Like, cause it's yeah. just going to space, just create a, create a new world. Yeah. I mean, like there's, you know, there's don't take anything too seriously. I think it's kind of the short answer yeah. because, you know, yeah. and, and I think that that's to me, the, the, the kind of golden mean way of going through it is like, you know, maintaining this aspiration towards excellence, um, and because to me, that's kind of where, you know, how you solve the problem of freedom. How do you become free? You become excellent. Yeah. How do you become excellent? You enslave yourself to yeah. something. Um, 
you know, these yeah. kinds of contradictory answers are not are not any kind of um, problem for me. But I think that, yeah, I mean, the, the 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 golden mean answer is strive towards excellence, but don't be too disappointed when you don't reach it. Uh, <laughs> because yeah. such is the nature of the universe in the world in which we live. Um, we got to wrap this up, man. I could seriously talk to you about this all day and half the night. You've been a, you've been an excellent yeah, yeah. guest. Uh, Josh Delani, where can people great. find you on the internet so they can continue to follow your observations about philosophy? Thanks, uh, Sam. Yeah, so people can find me on Twitter, uh, the old books guy, you know, pretty straightforward. And yeah, that's basically where I'm my most informal. So that'll be a good place to find me, Twitter, the old books guy. I will. And thanks, Sam. Really enjoyed the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you giving me the time. This is one of the longest episodes we've ever done with an outside guest. And I think every minute oh, of it. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Every, every minute yeah. of it has been totally worth it. Uh, as always, the Resistance Library podcast is brought to you by ammo.com. You can get $20 off any order of $200 or more by going to ammo.com forward slash podcast. We have most of the common calibers that you guys can't find at your local gun shop in stock. Uh, so go ahead, check it out, ammo.com forward slash podcast. I am Sam Jacobs. This has been the Resistance Library podcast, and we will see you next time.